Ravi was one of those men who many would consider to be, if not one of, uh, the leading apologist representing Christianity in the world today. And what that essentially means to be an apologist is you defending um, Christianity, the faith, and often engaging in the universities with some of the leading thinkers in the world today, often agnostic or atheist. And so he was a hero in the faith. Ravi Zacharias' own ministry uh, just recently released, released a report um, which confirmed many of the very serious uh, allegations to do with uh, sexual sin. There have been shockwaves going throughout the world since that report came out. Many Christians, and I'm sure unbelievers as well, have felt the impact of those shockwaves. Um, and so we would like today to just maybe uh, talk about some of the lessons that we can learn from when, what went wrong with, with Ravi Zacharias. So maybe Andrew, just uh, f first of all, just a very warm welcome. Thanks, Thank you for, uh, thank you for coming in. And uh, for those of you who don't know, Andrew leads uh, 412 as a partnership of churches and my own church, Just Your Generation Church. Um, so Andrew, obviously like for you, um, you're also a high profile leader in, in the church and maybe have experienced some of the similar pressures that Ravi has been through. Help a person like me who, you know, um, has a massive respect for a man like Ravi. He's, a, a, he's a, a fatherly figure, a man known for wisdom, a man known for representing Christ on the global scene, for preaching the gospel. If, you know, he's in universities. Um, he, he's got an incredible reputation and a long-lasting reputation. But now it's revealed that there's this incredible double life that he's been leading. Uh, and it, the, the mind boggles to think how it's possible that, that these two things can be true at the same time. Could you maybe shed some light on that? Yeah, I mean, I think the story of Ravi is so tragic. And I know even your own wife basically recommitted a life to the Lord through his ministry. Yeah. So, so many lives have been touched by this man and the incredible good things that he did. And then to hear the terrible things that have come out now, it's just created so many questions for so many. And I think the thing to realize is that leaders are people too. And, you know, as much as we may have great ministries and even great abilities and anointings, it doesn't mean that we are exempt from sin. And the Bible is very clear, you know, the Bible, uh, that we must flee from sin. Don't give the devil a foothold. And the danger is obviously be, uh, Ravi at some point in his life opened the door to sin. There was an area in his own life where he was tempted. And the Bible says we're all tempted in every way. I'm tempted. I have to put to death the misdeeds of my flesh. But Ravi, for some reason, in some moment, gave in to the flesh. And I think the danger with this is that the Bible says that sin gives birth to sin, gives birth to death. And so... Um, Ravi, obviously, giving into sin at some point, opens the door for the devil, opens the door for sinfulness in his life, and begins to do things that he shouldn't do. In he I think it's Hebrews 3 verse 13, the Bible actually says that we get hardened by sin's mm. deceitfulness. And so the danger here is, you know, you do something wrong, uh, and then you have to, you actually get hard much, your heart gets hardened. And so you come out of that situation, and maybe to use a a, a story of how it might have played out or could play out. Mm. Uh, you come out of a situation, an illicit sexual relationship, which you shouldn't have fallen into. Uh, you know, maybe somebody asks you, where were you? And now you've got a second sin because you either share the truth or you you cover it. You're and I'm sure Ravi must, yeah, yeah, and I'm sure Ravi must have thought, geez, the ministry is so big. So many people are depending on me. You know, all over the world, there's Ravi Zacharias Ministries. There's an international ministry. So in his mind, very easily could justify you know, maybe just going to put this down, cover it up, uh, and it'll go away. And so lies again, but now he's being hardened by sin's deceitfulness. And there's mm. a deceitfulness that comes about that grows and grows and grows and grows until eventually you end up with this compartmentalized life because, yeah. because you don't bring that into the light, the devil's got a foothold in your life. And so you begin to become ruled by that sin. You know, the Bible says if we live in the light as he is in the light, we have true fellowship and the blood of Jesus covers us. And so because of accountability structures not being in place, Ravi continues down that road and that thing slowly takes him captive. Mm. The scary thing is in the letter to Romans, we read that Paul speaks about uh, that the, the church in Rome literally starts to believe a lie and starts to do what should not be done. And so sin has a way of actually making us eventually believe lies yeah. and do what we shouldn't do. And, and sin, no matter who you are, you know, if Jesus had opened himself up to sin, <laughs> sin would have done in him 
what it would do in us. Mm. Sin kills. So you're saying Ravi would even believe his own lie? That's what Eventually you're you start to believe your own lie. And I've seen that so many times in counseling people. People start to believe their mm. own lies. They justify their own sin. They justify their own actions. It's one of the most terrifying things in human nature. It's very scary. It's terrifying. If you would believe your own lie. And, and that's very common. Um, that is probably one of the biggest common problems I find in ministry is we believe our own lives mm. we create. And so that's the need for accountability and others that can speak into our lives. But it's tragic. A man of his caliber with a double life, uh, with a part of him that was just in living in absolute sin and brokenness and another part that was so powerfully used by the Lord. I'm sure we must all compartmentalize our lives to a certain extent. But I mean, this must be an extreme case of that because you've got a man who's like maybe um, he's, he's sinning like outrageously so, then he goes on to set, he prays, and then he answers questions about Christ, mm. shares from the heart, mm. in the spirit. There seems to be a gifting and an anointing flowing. I mean, this is this scary. is scary stuff. Mm. So like, how is it possible then? Because I mean, I think this is a question that I'm asking and many people are also wondering about is how is it possible for a man to be used you know, for Christ in such a powerful way. So, that, so that's the gifting aspect. While right back at the ranch, there's like this crazy sin happening. Uh, Romans eleven twenty nine tells us that God's gift and his call are irrevocable. So obviously God gave Ravi an incredible ability. I mean, Ravi's mind was just unbelievable. Um, and so he was using that well. And, you know, you could, I've said this many times, you could actually be sinning outright and continue to flow in the anointing and in the gifting because God's put it on us and he doesn't take it away. And so obviously Ravi was doing that and getting up under the anointing, you know, speaking eloquently, brilliantly, you know, defending the gospel. But then when he would go away from the stage and on his own, uh, obviously, uh, you know, the, the harp's gone, the moment's gone, presence is gone, because often when you minister, you do feel the presence of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And it's in that place that he would give in to his darker side, to his sinful side, and really just live the lie. And then, unfortunately, probably justified it. You know, you compartmentalize, you kind of think, I'm sure when he started, it was probably just little sins. <laughs> Uh, but then you start thinking, oh my goodness, if this comes out and the world finds out, how many millions of people will be touched? The whole ministry, how many lives have now given themselves into that ministry? And so I'm sure he must have justified it and you know, kind of closed that door and then just not want to open it and then would keep falling but not bring it into the light, not dealing with it. And so ends up living a total double life. Yeah. So maybe um, like now to do with his his actual books that he's written. And I mean, I've done some of his courses, as I've mentioned, I've learned actually a lot from his ministry. Is it possible then that under the anointing, what he's doing is true and it's actually helpful in some ways while at the same time being like a tainted vessel? Mm. Like, I mean, that's a question I've wrestled with, mm. but maybe if you could speak into that. You know, the, the amazing thing here is the Lord does use tainted vessels and some, to some degree we all tainted mm. and he's used us. Um, so, yes, yeah, certainly what Ravi said and the things that he said that were true are true. I mean, Paul at one point even quotes pagan philosophers in one of the letters in the New Testament, and that's brought into the Holy Scriptures. So, you know, the Bible says, you know, if we lack faith, then God is true and, and he remains faithful. So the reality of it is a man's failure doesn't change the fact that what he said at some point was true. Mm. Uh, and certainly a lot of the things that Ravi did and the arguments that he made for the gospel were great arguments. Unfortunately, though, Paul writes about, you know, doing all these great things for the Lord and yet maybe himself being disqualified in mm. the end because he didn't run his race faithfully to the end. Yeah. And so unfortunately, Ravi was disqualified yeah. in that sense. So now to, to maybe tag on there in terms of like the nature of salvation, I know that some people have come out to say, well, Obviously, Ravi was never saved. Um, I mean, I don't think I would necessarily jump to that conclusion. But I mean, the question does need to be asked, like, is it likely that he went to heaven? I mean, we obviously can't make the mm. final call because only mm. God knows. Mm. But what are your thoughts on that? You know, as I was thinking about, just thinking about that here, um, the wisest man who ever lived, the Bible says, was Solomon. And I mean, he was anointed by God, king of Israel, you know, the son of David, uh, and had this incredible ministry. I mean, literally the nations, pagan nations came to see the wonder and the splendor of what God did through his life and his, and his ministry as a king. But in the end of his life, he ends up building pagan temples to pagan gods and offering pagan sacrifices sure. and totally, in that sense, denies the Lord who, who, who was his God and becomes an idolater. And you think, how is that possible that the wisest man ever lived ended up there? And, you know, is Solomon saved? 
I don't think he is. I mean, I know the Jews, if you go to Israel, they believe he was saved. I don't know that he was in the mm-hmm. end. Um, I, I think he was. Uh, and so you bring that back to Ravi. Yes, the anointing was there. He did great things. But because those things happened in his life, was he saved in the end? I don't know. I do think he was saved at some point. There was enough evidence, I think, yeah. of, of the love of the Lord, yeah. of a love for truth. Um, and I know he came out of a pagan background, an idolatrous background, and had Quite seemed a to have a, yeah, a yeah. real encounter with the Lord, you know. But this the, the speaks about the need to persevere mm-hmm. in our faith to the end so that we can be saved. Yeah. And Ravi didn't. He drifted. And unfortunately, it seems never repented right through to his last days. Mm. It's amazing. I think that the analogy that you used with Solomon, for me, that's such a fitting analogy. Because when I think of Ravi, I think wisdom. wisdom. Like he's a primary, mm. like he was, I think he had a gift of wisdom. Okay. And, and Solomon, obviously the wisest man in the, uh, alive. So the, oh. the analogy, I mean, the comparisons are quite striking that's between right. and both very sobering. You know, the very. fact for me to think that Solomon might not be in heaven. I mean, my brain just spins just even thinking of the possibility of that, you know. So that maybe let's talk a little bit then about like the fact that Ravi is in, not to downplay his life, but he seems to be like one in a long line of high profile leaders within the evangelical Mm -hmm. church um, who had a spectacular fall from grace. So, so I, I mean, the inevitable question I think which people are asking is, is there a problem within the evangelical church in terms of why does this seem to keep happening? What are your thoughts on that? You know, I would answer that yes and no. Um, yes, there's a problem. I think we've created superstars and and parachurch ministries like Ravi's where he's not living his life within the yeah. realm of a church where he can be known and loved and cared for and, and held accountable. Um, so yes, but at the same time, no, I think these problems have always been there. You go, I mean, if you look at the 12 apostles, this was the 12 that Jesus laid his hands on and appointed to be apostles. They're the foundation pillars of the church. And one of those 12 Judas denies him and hangs himself and uh, is clearly not in heaven today. And you think how, you see, the danger in our world today is one out of 12 how many, because of the world that we let, the world so small today, we have such access to so many. If you do the sums, we're probably doing just as well as they did then. It's just the reality mm-hmm. of that men fail. Uh, men are not as faithful always as the Lord is. And unfortunately, we, we do see um, and hear of many that are falling. That said, we mustn't forget that there's many that are running their race faithfully to yeah. the end. You think of Billy Graham who recently mm. went to be with the Lord and you know, never a shadow over his life right to the end and, and many others I could think of. So yes, there are failures in the church. There always have been, um, but that shouldn't change the way we see the kingdom and the, and the ways of the king. Mm. And for yourself, like I mean, I mentioned at the beginning that you yourself have a high profile in, in 412. It, with Ravi, I mean, I suppose the question is, it seemed like there was a different standard for him mm. as there was for everyone else on the mm. team. Like they just seem to have accountability uh, systems in place within the team, but Ravi seemed to have this untouchable sort of s- s- position. Mm. How does it work within 412 and for you specifically? Like what, 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 how, how would you speak into that? Yeah, the danger with someone who really is, you know, effectively touching people's lives as Ravi did, is people do start to respect you and love you and give you a grace because you, you're ministering such life to them. Um, and there's a real danger in that. And I think every leader needs to be conscious of that fact and effectively build uh, uh, things around him to make sure that he doesn't fall prey to this celebrity profile thing, which, which Ravi obviously did. And so in our circumstance, uh, I think there's a, a different... There's probably a different culture in our, in our, I can use the word organizations, although I don't think what we're in is an organization, um, in that we believe that we are all equal. I often think of myself, I'm first a brother before I'm a leader. Mm. And I hope I reflect that well in how I come across when I'm with saints. Mm. Uh, we, we've tried to not build a superstar mentality. Um, and and I, at the same time, I have effectively, um, and try and teach others to do the same. Find people that'll tell you what you don't want to hear. Mm. Find people that'll not agree with you. The first elder I think we appointed was Russell Fraser. And Russell was so frustrating because he was so different from me and saw things so differently and would often, you know, challenge me or disagree with me. And I needed that because I am aware that I'm convincing as Ravi must have been. And so we have to be very careful that we build effective uh, cultures that can hold everyone to the same account because we all are prone to sin. There's not one of us that, you know, is exempt from these things. Yeah. And especially when you come into high profile, we need to have accountability structures in place to keep us safe. I mean, I've, I've obviously been on your team for a long time in terms of eldership and I've been in your church for 
a very long, long time. time. Um, and I've, I mean, I've noticed that you seem to almost intentionally be like more transparent than most saints I know. Is that something that you, is that something you've intentionally chosen to do because of you being in leadership or what's behind that? You know, I live in a world where people struggle to trust and there's a culture that I think is demonic that I'm part of that is just you know, me, myself and I, mm. me and Jesus. And I realized to build a church that would reflect the kingdom properly, we would have to do differently. And I realized as a leader, it's important what I do, not what I say. So Paul says to Timothy, you know, set an example for the believers in speech and life and love and in doctrine. And so I've always tried to model accountability and openness. The Bible says if we live in the light, as he's in the light, we have true fellowship. Uh, and the blood of Jesus covers a multitude of sins. So I've always tried to open myself up to public scrutiny. I've opened myself up to, my, you know, in terms of my failures to others so that uh, people can learn from my victories, but also my failures yeah. and try to keep myself accountable all the time so that um, I don't get led astray because the heart is such a deceitful thing. Mm. I'm terrified of my own heart. I know how easy it is to self-justify, to, yeah. you know, to convince myself that I'm right, as Ravi must have done. So we've tried to build these structures in place, which are biblical, yeah. to hold us to account. Yeah. One of, one of the extreme reactions that I've seen, I say extreme, but it's common, is that um, maybe on the opposite end, which is like, you know, uh, you know, we shouldn't be surprised when people like Ravi um, fall because he, after all, is human just like I am and just like you are. But that seems strange on an, in another sense. Like, are we, are we uh, unwise or um, naive to expect more from our leaders in terms of morality than we ourselves are living in. Is that an un unrealistic expectation? Is that unbiblical? You know, I, I think one of the problems here really to answer this question in a bit of a roundabout yeah. way is uh, the Bible says it's through the church. And when the Bible says the church, it doesn't mean anything it calls of Christian. It talks about the, the actual organism of the church, mm -hmm. the, the community of faith, the saints, the elders, deacons, the, the, the things that the church would have, which is, uh, elders and elders are in mutual submission one to another. There's qualifications, life qualifications mm. that should qualify a person. I think one of the biggest problems we face today is parachurch, which is organizations that spring up outside of the organism that God has decided to use, the church. And they become very effective, but they don't have this, the, the systems in place of safety. They don't have uh, the, the organisms of life, which Christ has brought about into the church. And so they become disconnected and are in real danger of of of, of getting getting led astray and failing. And I think that is something that we're seeing in some degree. We're seeing a judgment of those yeah. parachurch organizations and ministries because the Lord has designed it through the church. You know, Paul the apostle, it was always the church, the church, the church. Paul was, he said, you know my way of life. You know how I've lived among you for your sake. And so the church is the vehicle. It's a safe mechanism. Not that not that it's perfect, but it is a lot safer than these other organizations and yeah. parachurch ministry. So I do think that this is something that we need to, you know, bring about and 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 come back to and and see ministries coming back to. At the same time, through the church, uh, we should be shocked when people fail. Yeah. The Bible does say that, you know, if an elder sins, he is to be rebuked publicly, so that others will learn from their example. Mm. And it, to imitate our leaders as well. I mean, how totally. can you imitate someone if they're not totally. living a morally Exactly. Uh, exemplary life. I mean. Exactly. And you know, I think it's so important uh, that as even in our own church, that we model and live these things. Uh, as you know, we've got a history of dealing with sin amongst us as leaders. So I think of years ago, Will Marie, uh, you know, was this apostle into the nations and it became, we became aware of the fact that there was an area of his marriage that wasn't reflecting Christ well and literally stepped him down on his way to an international conference and worked through a process of restoration um, and really him getting victory in that area, which has borne great fruit. And we were able to see him restored and work forward. Recently, I think it was four of our young pastors that were asked to step down because of just pornography and just were, again, bringing it into the light, processing it so that we could see these guys coming through. I think these are things that we need to come back to. I think we should be shocked. I think leaders yeah. should set an example for the believers and everything. Um, but at the same time, in our shock, we shouldn't then overreact the yeah. other way and throw a baby out at the bottle. Well, then I'm not going to trust any leaders. Leaders are going to fail. Mm. Um, but we need, we need to try and pick ones that will hopefully run yeah. away as well. So maybe like to bring it back to the saint and we can maybe end on this is like for many saints, I think 
they'll be feeling like, well, you know, we called to a life of holiness. I know that I've got a Holy Spirit living inside of me, yet we have these struggles. We have these wrestles with sin. It's a daily thing. I'm beating my flesh mm. into submission, like Paul would say. And then you've got somebody like Ravi, he's like a father in the faith. Um, and, and if he can't win, how on earth am I going to? What would you say to encourage a person in that sort of situation, that wanting to live a life of mm. holiness? I would answer with he, Jesus, is able to finish the work that he starts. And he is, he works so hard to bring us through, you know, and I think the Lord, he, he is incredibly kind and gracious. Uh, if we remain in him and we keep our hearts tender before him, we, we live the way he has asked us to live in terms of accountability, you know, within the context of a church in mutual submission, we should actually be seeking out people to speak into our lives to help us gravit you know, correct things in us and so we continually grow in Christ likeness. He is faithful to finish what he starts and there are many that run their race to the end uh, faithfully. In the early church you see many of the letters written are, are written to brothers who have drifted, you know, who have drifted away from the faith, the letters to the Hebrews. Yeah. Uh, in many of James and Peter's, you know, parts of their letters are written about false believers now that have, you know, drifted away or infiltrated the church. So yes, there will be those that fall away. But if we remain in Him, He wants us to come through more than we want to come through. Mm. And I believe the Lord keeps knocking at our doors, keeps disciplining us because He is faithful yeah. to finish the work that He starts in us. And so we can find an assurance in Jesus and we shouldn't be filled with fear. Yeah. But at the same time, we should have a little bit of concern and fear that uh, if Ravi can fall, yeah. Then, but by the grace of God, go I. Yeah. And so let me walk carefully with humility, uh, lest I fall in the same way that he did. Yeah. I think, I mean, the, it, there's no person that can walk away from the situation not feeling some kind of a healthy fear. That scripture, which springs to mind, we mentioned it beforehand in the 1 Corinthians 9, verse 26. But this is Paul. Yeah. I mean, never mind Ravi. Yeah. So I do not run aimlessly, I do not box as one beating the air but I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Yeah. I mean, it's so easy to read over that scripture so glibly, yeah. and uh, it's almost like a hypothetical situation which could never actually happen. But yet, I mean, in this situation, you realize that that actually is totally yeah. possible, that on yeah. the one hand, it's only by grace, and I have to press into grace, mm. like you were saying. Mm. It is impossible mm. to run to the end. But on the other hand, there's this healthy fear mm. Um, so maybe end with a word of encouragement in terms of, for, for, it, do, it doesn't seem to get easier, does it? I mean, this Christianity, is it just me or is it like a daily thing of wrestling with sin, like pressing into Jesus and, and ultimately trusting that he's going to bring me through to the end? Is it the same for you? Like you've been serving the Lord for like a couple of decades longer than me. Tell me. <laughs> I would say it gets easier and harder. Yeah. You know, it gets easier because... You, uh, the Hebrews text, text talks about having trained themselves towards yeah. good yeah. or evil. And so we can train ourselves. There's definitely yeah. a sense of the more I do something, the easier it gets. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a sense that the more I have victory over little areas of sin, so I start to I gain traction. And it's mm -hmm. like, wow, I'm actually, I'm growing in my faith. I'm, I'm growing in holiness. I'm becoming like the Lord. But at the same time, it gets harder. You know, I, I think of um, sometimes the pressures of ministry, which I know Ravi used as an yeah. example or a reason why he fa failed. You know, often he would say to the ladies, for example, you know, this is my release. This, I've earned this. I, and I, and I think that the pressures of ministry grow more and more and more. I mean, every decision I make, I, I keep thinking, I'm an ex-drag addict that lives in a car for two years. I mean, I was this free, free spirit. Now, every decision I make changes and touches lives all over the world. It is terrifying and it's burdensome. Mm. And so Paul writes about this burden that he carries for the churches. And sometimes that burden, if not careful, carefully, can actually cause us to even sin. It can cause us to mm. even just want to escape. Uh, and so I think it gets easier and harder, yeah. but we've got to trust that the Lord is able to finish the work that he started in us and look at those that did finish their race. Paul did finish his race well. He ran to the end. Peter failed, but came right and repented and ran to the end faithfully, you know. And so we can look at them and others in our day who run faithfully to the end and say, Lord, you're able to keep me. Mm. But at the same time, I look at Ravi, I look at Judas, I look at Solomon, I look at many that didn't. Nicholas, the early deacon in the church who it's claimed started the Nicolaitan heresy. Lord, keep mm. me, keep me because you're faithful. Mm. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much, Andrew, for shedding some light into this topic. I think I'm feeling encouraged. Uh, I'm <laughs> hoping that you watching this uh, at home uh, have kind of grasped the soberness on the one hand, but also the encouragement that there is in Christ on the other hand. And I trust that this has been a blessing to you.
Thank you for taking the time to listen to this episode of Be Equipped. Please like and subscribe in order to get access to more resources.